Hello, everybody, and welcome to week two strategic management content video, where we're going to be looking at answering the question, what is strategy? By the end of this presentation, you should have the ability as a group to come together and develop a working definition of strategy for yourself. And the reason we're doing this is you can find a definition for strategy. You can find one in your book. You can Google the definition of strategy and come up with hundreds of definitions. So there is no one single definition of strategy that we're gonna work with. But as a group, I want you all to come up with a, a working definition that works for your group throughout the rest of this class. Now this screen here, we did in class, and you can see some of the responses when I asked, what is strategy? Planning, design, layout, plan to execute, steps to achieving, specific methods to do. So all of these are good. But I think a really good place to start in our understanding of strategy will be with this gentleman here. Now the video quality on this is not very good, but the sound is decent. This is Michael Porter, Harvard professor. And we're going to use at least one of his concepts, tools in this class. It's actually used quite widely in business. It's known as Porter's Five Forces of Competition. And we'll look at that in more detail later on in the class. But for right now, I thought what we would do is we would listen to him talk about strategy and why most organizations struggle with strategy. Now, I would guess that most all of you would agree that you need a strategy in your organization. Most, most business leaders agree with this statement. I think you would also agree that competition is getting stronger. That's very true here in the Gulf region, where markets are opening, where competition is rising, uh, where uh, it's not so easy anymore just to be successful because you're here, because you have a history. You have to earn your success. And in order to earn your success, Again, you need a strategy. And probably the need for strategy is greater today than ever before. I think we would all probably agree with that. But I have found, as I work with companies all around the world, I found something very remarkable. I found that actually most companies don't have a strategy. Everybody works hard, everybody goes to the office every day, everybody does many, many things, but there's really no strategy in any meaningful sense of that word. There's a lot of confusion today about strategy. There's a lot of management fads that have confused leaders as they think about how to build a strategy for their organization. So what I'd like to do today in this very little amount of time is to talk about this very, very basic question. Do you have a strategy for your organization? How do you tell on what principles should the strategy be based? Is the strategy sustainable? Is it something that you're going to be able to maintain over time and maintain your success? It's these very basic questions that every one of us has to answer in our own organization. Uh, they're in some sense the essence of management. Now, if we can uh, move our slides forward, uh, uh, let's, let's start here. Why do companies have difficulty with strategy? Well, I think that the, probably the first reason that there's so much confusion about strategy is actually that 
Many managers have a confusion about how to think about competition itself. The way you think about strategy has a lot to do with how you think about competition and the marketplace. Now, what I found as I've worked with companies around the world in, in, in many industries is that the, the most common way of thinking about competition is on the left of the slide. Managers think about competition as competing to be the best. It's very natural for managers to want to be the best company in their industry. The best real estate group, the best bank, the best uh, distributor, the best automobile company. Many managers think that that's the job of competition, how to be the best. To understand what the customer's real needs are, to understand how to best organize production, that's the fundamental challenge of competition, how to be the best. This is a very natural way to think about competition. It's very natural because it kind of fits with many of the, uh, the things that we often talk about, like sports. You know, when, you're, when you have a sports competition, you want to be the best. You want to be the best football player. You want to be the best tennis player. So it's quite natural to think of competition in business as competition to be the best. However, what we found is that that's a very dangerous way to think about competition. Why is that? Well, first of all, in business competition, there is no best. There is no best way to be a bank. There is no best way to be an automobile company. It all depends on what needs you're trying to serve. Is BMW the best car? Well, it's a good car. It meets a certain set of customer needs. But uh, Volkswagen is, is a good car, too. It meets a different set of needs for a different customer. There is no best in business competition. That's the wrong question. In business competition, instead of thinking about the fact that your job is to be the best company, the, the proper way of thinking about competition is that your job is to create a unique company, a company that offers something different, a company that offers something unique in which it has an advantage over its competitors. If you think about competition as just trying to be the best, that often leads you to have a very destructive competition, where in order for you to succeed, your competitor has to fail. We find that any competition which is like that is a very dangerous competition. It's very, very hard to win. Instead, if you think about competition as how to make your organization unique and different, and to deliver something that the competitors can't offer, that creates a form of competition, actually, that's much more likely to lead to company success uh, as well as uh, to benefit society, to produce unique products, to cre create unique value uh, for the customer. Now, I... Right, and he brings up some really interesting points. The idea that there is no best in business. And the goal of strategy isn't to become the best at anything, but to become unique. And this idea is that when you're developing your strategic advantage over your competition, it's not that you do everything better than you, than, the, than your competition does, although sometimes that is the case is that you have something that makes you very unique. Your product, your service, maybe it's something else. Maybe it's the way you develop your employees. Maybe that sets you apart. Maybe it's the way that you deliver your product or service or how quickly you can deliver your product or service. There's all kinds of ways that you can differentiate yourself and make your organization unique in some way that causes it to have a 
competitive advantage above its competitors. So here we're gonna start looking at some of the characteristics of a strategy. Some basic things that we have to know, understand. And the first is that the future is unknowable. There are always things that are gonna happen that we can't predict. Now we can look at trends and make a best guess about where those trends are gonna take us and how we need to respond. We can look at patterns. We can look at demographic information. We can look at psychographic information. We can look at all kinds of sources of information and then try to predict what's going to happen. And that is the nature of strategy, to plan for a potential future. But there will always be things that are unknowable. For example, when the pandemic hit, when we shut down our economy in March of 2020, nobody expected that, nobody planned for that. No analysts saw it coming, but it happened. And things like that will happen all the time, maybe not on that scale, but there will always be unknowable things that happen that nobody saw coming and that nobody planned for. So the future is unknowable. We also have to get comfortable with the idea that there is no correct answer. Now, some of you are gonna be uncomfortable with this, and I understand that, and we'll have to work through that. But the truth is in strategy, there is no one correct answer. There are some answers that are better than others. When you do your strategic alternatives, for example, you're gonna come up with three to five strategic alternatives for the organization your team selected. And eventually you're going to have to determine which one of those strategic alternatives is best. And you're gonna to have to be able to back that up with your research, back it up with data. Why is it the best? What advantages does it have? What disadvantages does it have? What risk comes with it? And you'll have to be able to look at that critically and look at all sides of it, knowing that this is the best answer that you can come up with, but it's not, it is not the one right answer. So we need to get comfortable with there not being one correct answer. We're gonna have lots of tools presented to us in this course, but those are frameworks only. Those are just tools that you can use to analyze the data so that you can critically think through the problem, the issue that your papers are asking you to address and come up with solutions and reason it out and present it in a succinct manner. The book provides you your tools, but your book does not have the answer in the sense that you can look at what the rubric is asking you and open your book and find the answer. That's not gonna happen. This class requires critical thinking. This class requires you to be able to work through the challenge, the topic, or the questions, thinking about them critically. And in critically, I mean by looking at both sides, pluses and minuses, pros and cons, and be able to develop the best answer, the best solution that you possibly can, and being able to, to support that with your research. We also need to accept that the world is impossibly complex. People are complex. People are always complex. There is no simple solution. There is no simple reason why people do things. There are a multiple influences and culture and all sorts of things impact us and affect us every day. And we make meaning in different ways from our interactions with the world. That's a very complex situation. And then because every business problem is a people problem, you have at least two people involved with every challenge and every decision and every situation that you're looking at. And so the world becomes impossibly complex and we cannot water it down to just a simple cause and effect relationship. We have to understand that it's incredibly complex and we have to look at it to dive into that complexity and see if we can make some sense of it in a way that uh, can answer the questions that our papers are going to ask us to answer. Now, if you don't know, saying I don't know is an acceptable answer. Now, a side note there, 
saying I don't know to a prompt in your papers will not be acceptable because that information you can find. But it's okay, the strategy to say, I don't know. It's better to say, I don't know, but I'll try to find out. At the same time, understanding that there is a knowledge gap that we're constantly dealing with. There is some knowledge that we can't get access to. There is some knowledge that may not even exist yet. Or if it does, it exists somewhere where we can't touch it or access it. So to some extent, we have to accept there are some things that we're not going to know. Now, strategy is the responsibility of leaders. Ultimately, it's the responsibility of the CEO to establish the organization's strategy and to make it work by delegating responsibilities to those who report to him or her. And then they continue to agree to delegate on down the line so that the right people are doing the right things. But strategy is a leadership responsibility. It is a leadership task. So keep that in mind. You are operating in this class as a business analyst. That is a leadership type position because you're going to be making recommendations to the CEO on what steps should be taken. Now, the next question I asked in class, because we're going to begin transitioning to talking about leadership a little bit, is what is the fundamental characteristic of a leader? So think of the most important characteristic that a leader should possess to be a leader. And these are some of the answers that came in. And these are all great answers. But we're going to look at it from a slightly different perspective that I believe is even more important in my view. What is the fundamental characteristic of a leader? A leader knows where he or she is going. You have to have a goal. You have to have a destination. You cannot lead people anywhere if you don't have a destination that you're heading towards. So the first thing that a leader must possess, the most fundamental characteristic, is that they know where they are going. Because how can you lead if you don't have a destination? There's an old leadership proverb that says, if you think you're leading and turn around and nobody's following you, then you're just taking a walk. And I think that's a very adequate, very appropriate visual of what leadership is. Now, if you have a destination, it implies an ethic. What do I mean by that? Well, an ethic means that you have a reason for going to that destination that it means something to you, that there is something that you see as worth doing even more than anything else you could be doing. And, and then you have the ability to communicate your destination and your ethic. So you communicate your destination with a story. We don't try to motivate people necessarily as much as inspire them. Instead, figure out something that is worth doing, that you really think is worth doing. Now, this is going to be the very first step for you to come up with your mission and vision statements. What do you think is really worth doing in your own life? should be something that you would commit a substantial portion of your time to, of your life to, something that you have deep reasons for pursuing. Then you have to be able to communicate that in a way that appeals to other people's sense of purpose. It's like, here's the purpose of the enterprise. And here's the reasons that it's not only eminently justifiable, but more justifiable than anything else we could be doing at the same time. Then explain what's in it for you and what's in it for the others. Then explain why the team can further the enterprise and further what's in it for you and for them.
And then how do you do that? How do you get a team together that is willing to be inspired by your vision, that shares your ethic, that shares a, a strong desire to go where you're going and where you're trying to lead them? We get some insight into that. We're going to look at Jean Piaget and the equilibrated state. Piaget was a medical man that turned to psychology and he worked primarily with children. An equilibrated state is a situation that's set up by two or more people where everyone is participating in the same state voluntarily. Piaget derives this idea from the way children set up games. So when children set up a pretend game, they negotiate a little narrative to begin with. And it's like they generate play and assign everyone their parts. Then they manifest the play and that's how children think. But everyone has to accept their part voluntarily or the game won't continue. So Piaget's ethical analytical claim was that a game everyone plays voluntarily is more sustainable and productive than one people have to be forced to play. And this is the distinction between the utility of freedom and the utility of tyranny. Now you could say that tyrants always win, authoritarians always win because they say do this or else. But Piaget's claim was that the enforcement costs are so high that the free society will outcompete the authoritarian society across time. Now, let's say we were gonna set up an organization. We have a choice. We could set up an organization along authoritarian lines. But then you compel people to perform with punishment and fear. It's better to motivate people positively. That way you motivate people positively when you say, look, here's the goal and here's your role. Here's what this will add to your life practically. And in terms of significant engagement and involvement. And if you can do that, people will with certain preconditions in place, competence, for example, and a certain amount of conscientiousness, participate in the game voluntarily. You don't have to overlord them. So imagine this. Let's say you take one group and you tell them to go home. Spend four or five hours to formulate a career plan about how they're going to contribute to the organization. So again, you're telling them go home in the space of about four or five hours, figure out how your life fits into our organization. Or we could take a slightly different route. We could take another group and tell them to go home and formulate a plan for their life that includes their job as a subset. Say you have 100 people in each group and run those groups head to head in a competition for a year to see who's most productive. Who wins? The group that formulated a plan for their life, that's who wins. They're actually 10% more productive. Now that might not seem by much, but 10% is still 10%. You can gain a 10% increase in corporate level productivity by having your people write out a plan for their life. There's a program online called the Future Authoring Program that thousands of people have done. And it increases the probability that university students will stay in university by 30%. So think about this. If people can't do something useful and productive for their own lives, what makes you think that they will do that for your organization? You want people to see how working for you serves the higher order purpose and their higher order purpose. If it doesn't, if they can't formulate that 
hierarchical purpose, they probably need to find another job because the one you gave them isn't the job for them. If your job runs counter purposes with your own life, how are you going to be motivated? The answer is you're probably not, or at least you're going to be stimmied constantly. So imagine that what you're trying to do is get everyone pointed in the same direction. I don't mean by eliminating all diversity of opinion or anything like that. The overall organization has a point or a goal. And then everyone in that organization has their point and their goals or their strategy. The overall organization has their point, everyone has their point, but they're integrated within that overarching coherent narrative. And that's the purpose of leadership. And to make that work at every level of the organization, that's what you wanna do. It's very difficult, but you build a stable organization if you can do that. So let's return to our question. What is strategy? We wanna come up with a working definition. And to do that, we wanna look at some of the parts of strategy. Strategy is both an art and a science. Now the science comes in your research, the data you gather, the information you gather. The art will be in how you put that all together and formulate a co coherent plan, strategy, and narrative and present that in your reports or your assignments. Strategy is always future focused. You can't have a strategy for things that have already happened. You have to have a strategy that's focused on the future and that is working towards a better future for you, for your organization, for the people who work with you, for your customers and all your stakeholders. It's used to, to determine a future state or a future condition, a future ending point. And it conveys that future to an audience. It establishes procedures and authorities or ways. So your strategy can establish the procedures and ways that you will execute it and the boundaries in which that execution will take place. It identifies the resources to include time, forces, equipment, and money or means necessary to reach the intended outcome. And it also manages the associated risks. And I want you to keep that in mind because I want you to keep the risks in mind constantly as you're working on your papers in this class. You always need to look at the benefits and the risks whenever you're proposing any new direction or strategy. Let's go back to Michael Porter for a minute. Porter says strategy should determine how organizational resources, skills, competencies, should be combined to create competitive advantage. Porter emphasizes the need for strategy to define and communicate an organization's unique position. And remember that it's a unique position. How are you different? In strategic planning, resources allocation is a plan for using available resources, including human resources. And remember that no matter how big the company is, no matter how powerful they are, no matter how much money they have, their resources are still limited. And strategy also considers what we will not do and who we will not serve. You can't be all things to all people and neither can any organization. So there's always this constant understanding in strategy. And part of your strategy is to identify who you're not going to serve because that doesn't help. Those, those particular customers will not help you reach your goal. Uh, and it's what will you not do? Because maybe there's business practices you shouldn't be engaged in or things you shouldn't be manufacturing for sale because they don't go along with your goals. All right, let's take make this person here. So in the circle is you. Now on the bottom, you have your resources. And just for a minute, think of the resources that you have in your own life to give to the activities that you're involved with. 
might be time, money, energy, focus, or your support systems. Those are all resources that you have. And you can come up with more if you sit down and think about this. And those resources have to be allocated to your activities. Say one is school, one is your relationships, uh, one is work, if you work. And you could find more things that you're involved in that you have to allocate your resources to. So you've decided that you're gonna be committed to school, your relationships, and your work. Now you have to take each one of your resources and decide how much time am I gonna to give to school? How much time to relationships? How much time to work? And then we go across at all of our resources. How much money do I have to give to school? How much money do I have to give to relationships? How much to work? Energy to school, to relationships, to work, and so forth. And that's where strategy comes in for you to plan out your own life. And I strongly encourage you to use these strategy principles to formulate a strategy for your own work, for your own life. But of course, to do that, you have to figure out what is the main goal of your life, the one thing that is most worth achieving over the next, say, 40, 50 years. Now, as I said, we're gonna work in groups to produce a working definition of strategy. And we will do that next week. I will remind you of all these things. I'll throw them up on the screen where in class, we will get together as groups and we'll, each group will come up with a working definition of strategy for itself. Some tips for you. Strategy can be difficult to define, but a good definition is determining how we will win in the period ahead. In business, there are different levels of strategy. Each of these has a different focus and needs different tools and skills. Corporate strategy focuses on the organization as a whole, while business unit strategy focuses on an individual business unit or market. And team strategy identifies how a team will help the organization meet its overall goals and objectives. All these are tips for you to consider as, as when as a team, you will come together and begin to formulate together your own working definition of strategy. So that's the week two content. If you missed a class this week, please review this content and then send me a one paragraph summary of what was most meaningful to you in this presentation. Hope I see you all in class this coming week. And if you need anything, reach out to me. Thank you.